thank you again uh, for being here and for your uh, thoughtful comments. I'm going to start off with some questions on the executive order uh, that led the beginning of the Bush, uh, Trump administration, sorry, uh, and uh, that you led with in your uh, speech. And the executive order and a lot of the uh, gu guidance surrounding it and the agency actions, there's a lot of focus on costs. And in your speech, you focus on costs, the premise being we have too many regulations, it's too costly. Uh, conceptually speaking, uh, there's a risk if we focus on too much cost, right? There are regulations out there that might be costly, but enormously beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that OIRA's role is also to mention benefits, but the concern, as I see it, if you focus too much on costs, is that you might be foregoing very beneficial regulations that are totally consistent with the statute uh, because of a budget, essentially, focused strictly on the cost side. Can you speak to how that uh, concern might be alleviated or whether or not you see it actually playing out? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is we, of course, do think about benefits as well as costs. We have been focused on costs, but benefits are, of course, important to us. And I think that this, in some ways, is reflected in the ordinary OIRA process, which requires that, um, you know, for a deregulatory action to make forward, it has to be more beneficial than costly. Right, So we're getting rid of regulations that are not, in fact, benefiting the public. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I think that's an important first step. And I think um, you, know, you can see that, that we, I don't think agencies are continuing to move forward with regulations that are required by statute or that they think are necessary to meet certain statutory goals. And, and I don't think that there's anything in our system that is really stopping that from happening. Uh, just, it, it actually. Uh, it seems to highlight essentially a fundamental dif uh, disagreement on what the role of net benefits are and whether or not we're seeing uh, positive net benefits from the regulatory process and regulations previous to this effort on deregulation. And every year OMB does release essentially a list of uh, an assessment of the uh, costs and benefits of the regulations that they've overseen. And I think every year it's always net benefit positive. Uh, should I be looking at those more skeptically? Uh, is that what you're saying? Is that the process as it exists previously, even though OMB and a lot of, I presume your staff were involved with that, tabulated these as positive net benefits that they were wrong? Um, I think it is important to, to look more closely at some of those numbers. Um, and, you know, because it's, it's often very easy to overstate benefits mm -hmm. or to overstate costs. And, and so we're trying to be much more rig rigorous about that. And um, so I think it is good to look at those a, a little bit skeptically. Yeah. Uh, and on the requirements themselves, the, the two-for-one requirement, which I, I think I should say is now a three-for-one requirement for the next year. For, for the, well, I don't, well, it's a three-for-one projection. Projection. <laughs> All right. I don't know if that's a requirement. Well, yeah. that, that might get to my question. Yeah. And a regulatory budget, mm -hmm. which I think is going to be projection to be negative mm -hmm. for, the, for the coming year. Mm -hmm. These seem to be process changes designed to constrain agencies from what you perceive as a regular over-regulatory impulse. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, I can see how they would work under different administrations, perhaps. But if you look at the cabinet members of this administration, they don't seem to have that impulse in need of constraining. So if you look at the success of the first year as you laid out on achieving the deregulation, were these binding or, or maybe put a probability weight? Was it more so because of the political appointees to head these cabinets uh, or these agencies just being predisposed against regulation? Mm -hmm. Or did these actually trigger you going back to the agencies and saying, no, 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 you've got to meet these requirements, take a look at your regulatory budget, where's your two for one, et cetera. So which, which is actually driving this more? Um, you know, I think it's both, right? It's all in some ways part of, you know, a broader view of the administration. I think the president appointed people to the cabinet because they were reform-minded, right? And they were interested in getting rid of regulatory burdens. And I think he's also, <clears throat> through his executive orders, made it very clear that this is an important administration priority. Um, so, so I think that that is all reinforcing. And at OIRA, um, what we've done is work with the agencies to make sure that they're meeting the president's priorities. And you know, some agencies have an easier time with that than others. So we do have an important role in the accountability. But <clears throat> the regulatory reform ideas really come up through the agencies. We ask them to set their own 
cost caps. You know, we didn't impose a cost cap on the agencies, right? These are numbers that they have developed um, in consultation with OIRA and other components of the EOP. Well, let me just ask on that, because my understanding is they each did have a no net increase regulatory budget for the first year. Are you saying they did not? They arrived at it, or this was some sort of dialogue no, process? Yeah, that's true. The executive order said for 2017 there should be zero. Yeah new regulatory costs, and that was set in the executive order. But looking ahead for 2018, the agencies set their more, their own substantially negative regulatory cost caps. Okay. So I guess uh, uh, just a related question on that, getting into your day-to-day -day job a little bit. How much do you find these mechanisms and the role that you're playing to be uh, assisting them along the way, but you kind of share the same philosophy, or how much do you find it being... Uh, uh, more kind of policing it, maybe aggressively policing it and saying, pushing back, <clears throat> maybe returning some rules uh, as citing the executive orders as the reason why? You know, well, we try to make it as cooperative as possible. And um, I guess I'm asking if you're succeeding. <laughs> if I'm succeeding, yeah. Well, in some contexts it's easier than others. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, we do work closely with the agencies. I mean, I think sometimes agencies want to um, to move more aggressively with deregulation, but you know, for much of the first year, they did not have their political appointees in place. Right, this has been a very slow confirmation process, and so there have been a lot of vacancies, which has actually made it harder. But at Awire, we have a lot of expertise, and so we've worked with the agencies, you know, to generate ideas to help them with their analysis, and so. So I think that that's been very constructive. Um, and, you know, there are areas where we can also, you know, maybe give them a little push to be more, um, to think more about the bigger deregulatory reforms that are sometimes harder to take on. So you mentioned a few times that uh, this uh, process, and presumably the executive order as well, uh, is moving us towards an a administrative state that's more consistent with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the word Constitution a few times, the Constitution of Values. There is currently a suit that was being brought by Public Citizen and I think NRDC, mm -hmm. essentially against the two-for-one rule and the regulatory budget, in their case, citing it as unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. uh, can I infer that you disagree with that lawsuit then? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think that would be fair to say. Yeah. All right. Do you want to give an assessment of where things are with that lawsuit? And I don't know if I really should speak to the lawsuit yeah. in, um, you know, specifically, but, you know, the president's executive orders on two for one and the regulatory cost caps, you know, state, I don't know, many times throughout those orders that they have to be executed consistent with law. And, and of course, all executive orders must be consistent with both the Constitution and with statutes. And you can see in the past year, um, agencies moved forward with some very costly rules that were required by statute. Um, for instance, the Department of Energy moved forward with a walk-in refrigerator rule on energy efficiency, a very costly rule. Mm -hmm. It caused them not to meet the zero regulatory cost cap, and I mean that, that's what happened, right? They had a positive cost allocation, and you know we're working with them to try to offset that in the coming year. But it's not a rigid system, right, where there's an important statutory requirement. Agencies, of course, have to regulate, and we will work with them to... Um, to be as consistent with the executive orders as is possible under the law. So I'm not, I'm not overly concerned with that because of the way, the way we're doing this is to be very mindful of legal requirements. So given the legal challenge to it, and then uh, looping back to what I referred to uh, before about the questioning basically how binding are these requirements in this administration, <laughs> is this something that you actually think, this being the, the offset requirement, the regulatory budget, uh, it seems to me that the likelihood of it persisting in future administrations, where clearly on the Democratic side, if, if that suit is representative of the Democratic side, they're highly critical of it. Uh, and also, and even on the Republican side, nobody's ever tried this before, at least in the United States or some evidence out, outside. Is this something that is uh, designed for the ages, or is this, you think, a Trump administration uh, mechanism that will, when he's out of office, will be the end of it? Well, it's always hard to predict what will happen. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, centralized regulatory review has persisted across administrations, although there have been challenges and concerns about the OIRA process generally. So I guess I would say that we hope that something like this can persist over time because I think it, it should be a bipartisan issue that agencies are regularly looking at existing 
burdens that they're imposing. And I think often they just move forward with new regulations without ever looking backwards. I mean, in the Obama administration, um, President Obama issued an executive order encouraging agencies to do retrospective review. And, and so, so the two for one, in some ways, just gives more teeth to that idea that we should be regularly revisiting the regulatory burdens we're imposing on the public. And I think that that's something that Democrats and Republicans can support because it's just a good government idea. You said something in your speech that I found interesting. The, as I gave you in the introduction, OIRA's common, commonly uh, known role is essentially on the benefits and costs and helping with the regulatory review process, uh, mostly on the numbers and on the analysis. You had said, I wrote down, that you had, uh, one of your roles is to see that you're satisfied that it has legal authority. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with just an example, which was, which was the clean power plan. Mm -hmm. So the, the administration proposed essentially rescinding the clean power plan, which was the uh, regulation offered by the Obama administration. Their proposal is strictly based, as far as I can tell, on a legal argument. Is that the purview of OIRA, that you actually have to sit down and evaluate whether or not their legal reasoning for rescinding a regulation like the Clean Power Plan is valid? And are you empowered to turn back such a proposal if you think it's not? Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, it's absolutely part of OIRA's role. And I think it's, it's a longstanding part of the role. I mean, if you look at Executive Order 12866, right, which President Clinton issued, it makes it clear that part of the review process is determining that a regulation is consistent with law. And, and you know, that's not just OIRA's determination. We put regulations through an interagency process, but so regulations go to the Department of Justice, and of course they look at the legality of rules from other agencies. You know, we work with the rest of the executive office of the president, so White House counsel is looking at regulations. So I think as part of the broader OIRA review process, there is a check to make sure agencies are acting consistently with the law. Which makes sense because if you think of part of the president's role to make sure that the laws are faithfully executed, um, that should be true in his regulatory policy as well in, as in other policies. So uh, this is my economist bias. I've worked in years past with OIRA, so I know a lot of the economists and some of the scientists. Do you have a staff of legal, aside from yourself, mm -hmm. uh, are there a staff of legal of lawyers and legal experts to evaluate the legality of a claim of a, of a legal argument, like for example with the Clean Power Plan, or is that something you rely on other agencies? Um, I think it's both. We have, I mean, the front office at OIRA, the other political appointees are actually all lawyers um, in this administration. And, you know, OMB has an office of general counsel, which has a lot of regulatory legal expertise. And as I said, um, rules also go to the Department of Justice and to the White House Counsel's Office. So we really have quite a, uh, we have a broad um, bench. Sure for legal expertise that we can rely on. Okay, so the, the Clean Power Plan, uh, of course, reminds me of climate policy. And one of the things that the Obama administration did was set up an interagency working group to establish a common estimate across all agencies to be used in the regulatory proposals and analyses on the social cost of carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the benefits of a regulation that reduces a ton of carbon? Uh, the Trump administration essentially rescinded all those guidelines, I think, in March, early in the, in the administration. So uh, what is your view now? Because some of these regulations, certainly a lot of them from energy and EPA that you're going to be reviewing, have some impact on climate policy, on carbon emissions. How should they go about estimating the benefits? Do they, can they arrive at different benefits for different agencies or even within agencies across different rules? Mm -hmm. Or is there some uniformity that you're trying to prescribe uh, on how they approach this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you've worked on this issue sure. a, a lot. Um, but, you know, so the president, as you said, in March issued an executive order, you know, directing a reconsideration of this. And, and I think one of the things the executive order, you know, a couple of the things that they said is that, you know, these types of effects need to be focused domestically, right, which I think is consistent with the statutory requirements. And also that agencies should be using a discount rate that's more consistent with the usual practice. And so that is in part what we're doing, and um, you know, we're looking closely at that issue, I think, across a number of different areas. And when you're looking closely on it, you're looking closely to make sure that they're all applying those existing uh, uh, parameters and guidelines, or are you looking closely as an impossibility of reevaluating what the appropriate discount rate is for climate change, for example? Well, I think in some ways it varies from context to context. So if you have any thoughts, let, well, let yeah. us know. <laughs> I have a few. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, it is true. I think there, you know, there's the circular A4, I think is what, uh, yeah. again, we're getting as lingo as you can get here, but those Very are the wonky. guidelines. It's not that funny, do... it's just wonky. <laughs> yeah, uh, that says, those are the guidelines that OIRA issued under Administrator John Graham. So we're talking, when was that, he, that he did 2001, 2002? Yeah. Uh, and so kind of our understanding of climate has changed since then which would call for perhaps a reevaluation. Perhaps that, I think, was the spirit of the interagency review process what, uh, on, on the Obama administration. So it strikes me as something worth considering from an OIRA point of view. Do those guidelines that were issued however many years ago, 16 years ago, still apply, or should they uh, be amended, especially on, these, on, on this issue in particular? Uh, I want to just uh, segue a little bit. Actually, one more question on the, uh, on the uh, executive order and the three-for-one and the regulatory budget. I think if I'm getting you correctly, there's sort of this push-pull, but it's mostly amicable, and you're working with the agencies to meet these requirements. You mentioned energy, and they didn't meet the budget requirements, so you're figuring out uh, what to do to work for them. What are, and this might be a question if these uh, mechanisms persist across administrations, maybe even more pressing, what are the consequences? What are the sticks, perhaps, that you can bring if an agency is uh, proposing a regulation that is not uh, in your mind, being offset appropriately in a budget sense or in a two-for-one or three-for-one, depending on mm -hmm. where it goes from here. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the consequences to that agency? Well, I think, I mean, in part, the consequences are that they are, I mean, they're not meeting the president's priorities. I mean, the president has spoken frequently about deregulation and deregulatory efforts at cabinet agencies, and I think that they're motivated by that, right? I mean, do you want to, when, at the end of the fiscal year, when we release all the numbers, you know, do you want your agency to be last? <laughs> peer pressure. You know, right, there's, I think there is some peer pressure, and, um, and I think that's been good, a um, little competition between the agencies to, um, to be you know, the best at regulatory reform. So I think that that's part of it. And you know, we recognize that the system has to be a little bit flexible, right, in terms of because we have a whole statutory system, we also have to respect while implementing the EOs. And um, so we, you know, we... But, you know, most agencies have lots of cost savings that they can go after. So if they need to do a big rule, we can work with them to help identify more savings and encourage them to do that. Now, not necessarily to discourage them from taking the regulatory action that might be important or required by law, but really to um, push them to be more aggressive in finding other things that they can cut back on. But one of the other things that the executive order did, which to my mind I think has a greater chance of being long-lasting, uh, uh, is they created these regulatory reform officers and regulatory reform task force, which mm -hmm. is essentially uh, someone in each agency with a group around him or her who's charged with actually essentially keeping track of compliance with this executive order, looking for regulations that might warrant deregulation or elimination. Uh, how is that mechanism working? Are these people working in concert with your team heavily? Are they, are they integral to the actual process of figuring out where the deregulatory opportunities are, keeping an eye on the regulatory budget? Have they been staffed up even across agencies? Mm -hmm. where, where is that process right now? That's a good question. I mean, we, I mean, at OIRA, we work with the regulatory reform officers. We don't keep tabs on the specific makeup or, you know, the work of the task forces except through our ordinary check-ins with the regulatory reform officers. So we work closely with them. Um, and, and I think it varies across agencies. You know, sometimes the ROs are senior political officials. In some cases, they're career officials. And so I think it's, it's varied quite a bit how agencies have approached that process. And we work with all of them, you know, irrespective of, of who they are. Okay, I want to uh, shift a little bit on this, uh, to the scope of OIRA and the regulatory review process. You said something I think I need clarifying. I think, uh, among other things, I learned from your speech, but I could use some help. Uh, the the uh, Congressional Review Act. Mm -hmm. I think what you said is independent. The, that act uh, uh, requires that independent agencies submit to a determination about whether or not the regulation is a major designated a major reg regulation. Is that correct? That's correct. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, the CRA that. applies to all agencies. All agencies. Mm -hmm. And does that mean that? Uh, it, but it does not require that those independent agencies. Uh, submit their regulations for the standard interagency review spearheaded by the by your office. That is correct. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, editorializing a little bit or commentary is that a, is that something you think should happen? What is the role? What you think should be the? And I know you've written about this in your mm -hmm. past academic life. 
What do you think should be the requirements of inter, uh, independent agencies? Does it vary by type of agencies, whether or not they're strongly regulatory or in the Federal Reserve, perhaps on monetary policy? What should be the, the proper role vis-a-vis uh, -vis involvement with the executive office and the process that you spearhead at OIRA? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, this question, um, you know, should agents, inter the so-called independent agencies be subject to a centralized review process? I mean, it has been one that's been around since President Reagan. Um, when they did the initial, you know, setting up of centralized regulatory review, they thought about this. There was an Office of Legal Counsel opinion saying it would be constitutional. And I think each subsequent administration has thought about doing this. And even President Obama issued an executive order suggesting very strongly that the independent agency should participate in this, at least voluntarily. So, so this is something that has been an ongoing thing. Um, and, and as I've written in my academic work, I think that there's, there's no at least constitutional reason to treat independent agencies as distinct from other agencies, at least insofar as they are issuing regulations, right? Sometimes independent agencies also adjudicate and do other things. But to the extent that they are regulating, there's no, there's no constitutional reason to treat them differently. And, and I think many people have argued, I think, across the spectrum that there are some important reasons to potentially bring the independent agencies into centralized review. I think the American Bar Association has supported this since the mid-90s. Um, the Administrative Conference of the United States has similarly supported it. And I think they support it for all the reasons why people often consider OIRA review to be good for other agencies, which is, you know, we can make sure that the regulations are consistent with law and that they meet rigorous cost-benefit standards. And um, those are good government practices irrespective of where the regulations originate. I, 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 uh, I guess I'm, uh, the, the concern I have is uh, you're focusing on regulation, I think, uh, understandably, but the legal argument would not, we're not in any way preclude, if you go with that argument, it would preclude um, more executive office and perhaps OMB or IRA oversight of non-regulatory actions of independent agencies. So uh, I, I, in particular, my head is the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. So the Federal Reserve Act essentially was established because the determination was in the setting of monetary policy, we need some sort of protection from political influence. Uh, so it's, ex it's essentially explicit in the design of the Federal Reserve Act. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm hearing you saying is there might be a constitutionality issue about that, that Congress cannot preclude uh, to create an office that, that is essentially an executive office that is precluded from uh, oversight of the, of the administration. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Well, you know, Where does the Fed fit in in your thinking on this? Always, the question is always about the Fed. Right? <laughs> well, what about the Fed? And I, well. think, um, I don't think anyone suggests that, that there should be White House review of monetary policy. Okay. So, I, you know, right. I think... You know, I don't think anyone is suggesting that. And, and you know, I mean, so. Okay. No uh, worries. Not sad. I, I think there's an interesting legal conversation yeah. about why that is. I, I think that's the well, right determination. I think, you know, independence has like a variety of components, right? Part of it is, um, you know, certain conventions, right? You, there are certain conventions against political interference of monetary policy, right? There are also statutory prohibitions, right? So there's sort of a... There are, I think, both legal and traditional and pragmatic reasons for some of these, yeah, so some of these, you know, features of independence, and and I think they all kind of work together. I'm uh, uh, humbly recognizing I'm debating a constitutional lawyer, yeah. <laughs> so but I do think that is the issue, as you just put it. Uh, there's an acknowledgement that there is, under some conditions or circumstances, a need for insulation from political influence, and that Congress establishes that for example, a monetary policy with the Federal Reserve. So now I think we're in a debate about, okay, well, there's a gray zone there, and what falls on what side of it. And so it's not, to me, as a clear-cut constitutional issue that independent, you can't be independent from, uh, from this kind of oversight. So uh, we can save that for another day. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I do want to, again, st stick to the scope, because this brings up another thing. It, it, we here at Brookings have a center called the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. So I just talked about monetary policy as it relates to you. So now I'm going to hit the fiscal policy okay. and promote the work of my good friends at the Hutchins Center, uh, which is uh, IRS rules, mm -hmm. which traditionally have been exempt from oversight uh, and the regulatory process, the 12866 process that you oversee in OIRA. Uh, is that something you see changing? There's been some discussion about that recently. Is that something you promote changing? Uh, I'll kind of come back to what I think are the challenges of doing that. Mm -hmm. But there, again, is a question of your scope. Should IRS rules, tax rules, which they're probably 
arguably would be more IRS tax rules than any other agency's promulgating of rules. Mm -hmm. uh, should that be under the purview of your, of your office? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I think it's an issue that's been receiving a lot of attention. Um, you know, you may recall that in April, the president actually issued an executive order that required OMB and the Department of Treasury to rethink some of these exemptions. So that was issued in April, and um, and we are we are thinking about this. It's it's an issue that actually has received a lot of attention in Congress. You know, I know Senator Hatch has held, held a number of hearings about this. Um, the GAO has issued reports, you know, criticizing this exemption, and there was recently an article in the Wall Street Journal about it. So it's something that we are looking at closely under the executive order. Um, and I think in terms of some of the challenges, I mean, the you know. OIRA never reviews particular matters, right, or individual rulings, right? That's not what we do for any agencies. Um, and so I think in the IRS context, when they are issuing generally applicable rules that are prospective, um, I, I'm not sure that there's any challenge there. Uh, it does strike me you would need a much bigger staff if you were looking at a lot of these rules on the IRS side. Uh, that's probably uh, for later consideration if you need it. But there's also, I think, just a... Uh, I would just suggest, obviously, you would do this. And if you go down that line, the cost-benefit analysis for a tax rule is a little bit different mm -hmm. from when you're talking about pollution reduction, for example. Right? The goal of the tax is to raise a billion dollars. That's not a cost. That's a goal, and it's a transfer. Mm -hmm. right? You raise a billion, it gets spent somewhere. Uh, you could argue about whether or not it's spent well, but that is the goal of the tax. Now there's a public finance literature what the economic costs are, but it's contained. The broader point is I think it's, it, it does create some challenges, at least, or reconsiderations of the standard, getting back to the document that's from the night, or from 2001. You know, even Circular A4 has a way of accounting for transfer yeah, yeah. rules, right? And so it's not totally different from rules we might see in other contexts where, where they're basically effectuating a transfer, and we have ways to account for that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm going to turn to the crowd in a few minutes, but I wanted to just follow up with a few more questions on transparency, since you mentioned that as one of the priorities there. I think the, the GAO just lost, uh, launched an investigation following a Wall Street Journal investigation on the prevalence of fake comments on proposed rules, mm -hmm. uh, finding that there are a number of uh, fake comments that, they are, that are flooding, actually, the, uh, the notice and comment uh, process. Is this something that surprised you? Is this something you've encountered? Is this something, in light of this news, that this exists, you're on alert for? How are you responding to that? To be honest, we were not aware of the extent of the problem previously. And I think you know, since we've become aware of the problem, we take it extremely seriously. And um, you know, my staff works very closely with eRulemaking, which is the website that takes in a lot of these comments. And so we are already working very hard to, to try to implement procedures that can cut back and eliminate these problems. So no, it's something we take very seriously. and. Um, and are really trying to get on top of. Uh, this is a, a slight good news story when I read that story for me. Uh, this is really making lemonade out of lemons. Uh, I was always skeptical of the role of public comments. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a very important component of our regulatory rulemaking process that the public gets a chance to comment. Uh, you know, if you ask my brother or cousin or mother, they have no idea that such a thing exists, even when the regulations apply mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't quite sure how seriously they're taking in the process. But the fact that somebody's gone through great pains to do fake comments, as much as I don't advocate that, suggests that someone sees value uh, <laughs> in the process. So that's my optimistic spin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that aside, or maybe related to that, how do you view that, the public comments uh, process, as it currently exists. I think you alluded to in your speech trying to improve it, mm -hmm. and I wasn't quite sure exactly how. It's a hard thing to do, especially, especially if you have to worry about fake comments, but just the sheer number of comments that they get. Uh, how, how can we ensure that people are getting the information about proposed regulations that are affecting them, that their comments are taken seriously, mm -hmm. assuming they're not comments from people who died 20 years ago, uh, uh, and how can we actually influence, how can the public better influence the regulatory process? Mm -hmm. I think those are, those are great questions. And I think, you know, um, 
people often say, like, how can we get involved in the regulatory process? And I think you're right. Most people don't have any idea that they can actually file comments online about rules that may be of interest to them. And, and people should be encouraged to do that. I think agencies take the comments very seriously, right? Someone reads all of the comments, and they have to give some reasoned um, response, I mean, not to every single comment, but to points that are serious that are raised in the comments. And so I think it is a very important aspect of our regulatory system. It's what gives it a legitimacy, frankly. And um, I think in terms of you know what can people to do, do to make their comments more salient, um, you know, I think when businesses and individuals provide concrete evidence of how rules are impacting them, I think that that is really very useful to agencies. Would you agree with me, though, that it's underutilized now? I guess it's hard for me to have a sense of that, um, you know, not reading all the comments oh, that, that I want you to in. ask your father, uncle, brother whether or not uh -huh. they've ever done public comments okay, yeah, <laughs> or well, even knew it was an option. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> not sure I've ever done public comments. <laughs> yeah. so, you know. uh, okay, I'm going to turn to questions. Uh, I ask that you wait for the mic. Once I call on you, state your name, and please, please, please keep it to a, a question. We're gonna, we got a lot of hands going up. So right here on the fourth on aisle, right, uh, my right side. There you go. Hi, Nick Florka with Inside Health Policy. Uh, I was wondering if you could give us your take on the FDA's current approach uh, towards deregulation, given FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb has taken what some may call an unconventional approach in saying that the, guy, the agency can actually deregulate by promulgating new regulations. I was wondering if that, that fits with the administration's push towards deregulation. Well, I think it's certainly the case that sometimes deregulation requires a new regulation, right? Because you're undoing something that previously existed, and so you need to promulgate a new regulation. Or, um, you know, sometimes certain forms of regulation can, can increase competition or innovation. Um, you know, because they provide certain boundaries around the marketplace, and I think that can also be a kind of deregulatory action. Mm -hmm. Go right here on the second row. Uh, wait for the mic, though. We got a microphone coming right there. Hi, this is, I'm Ted Knutson. I guess we're this is Ted Day at Brookings. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I'm a blogger for Forbes. Uh, Naomi, uh, what? things do you plan to do to put the, as you said, so-called um, uh, independent uh, financial uh, regulatory agencies under uh, Al Raya's um, uh, umbrella? What things are you planning to do? And then also I have a follow-up question. Just one. Sorry. We're just going to... Okay. We, we oh, let's, let's make it a two-part question. Then. Very quickly. Two-part. The, the second part is, heard of the argument that if you... Um, put the independent regulatory agencies under ORIA, it makes rule making more susceptible to um, you know, the whipsaw whims of the public, which uh, of investors, which means you could have more booms and busts. Um, well, as I mentioned before, I mean, it's, um, you know, with respect to the, the independent agencies, it's something that we're thinking about and considering. And so I guess... I guess that's what I'm able to say at this moment. So, uh, let's go in the all the way in the back. I see a purple sleeve. <laughs> all right, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl Bolin with Bloomberg BNA. Um, agencies have been estimating costs and benefits for years. Why do you believe that benefits have been overstated and costs have been understated? And do you think the methodology needs to change? Well, I think, um, you know, I mean, if you consider, you know, looking, for instance, at the social cost of carbon, right, the, the effects of that was considered globally, right? So if you were taking a regulation that affects, um, affects domestic producers of energy and you are looking at the benefits across the world, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, a particular choice, right, a choice that may not have been supported by the statute. I mean, I think... You just have to look very carefully at these things. It's, um, you know, it's often easy to overstate either the costs or benefits depending on what you're trying to achieve. And so we just want to be very, we want to be very scrupulous about that um, on both sides. All the way in the back. Wait for the mic, please. We have a lot of questions. Okay. Go 
Jamie Conrad, Conrad Law and Policy Council, you threw some red meat to the audience when you said you were systematically trying to crack down on bad regulatory practices. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, identify what some of those are and how you're cracking down? Well, I think I mean, some of the examples that I gave are, are largely related to the process of changing regulatory requirements through guidance documents, right, or through letters. And, and I think that, I mean, these are especially problematic because even if you support the policy that's happened, it's occurred without any notice, right? It hasn't followed any process. The public hasn't had an opportunity to comment or weigh in. Um, and so, so agencies, you know, we think shouldn't be able to change obligations on the public without following the proper administrative procedures. And, and you know, agencies often want to do this because, you know, the proper procedures take time. You know, they require a lot of analysis. And, um, and they may hear comments that they, that they don't like, right, that push against what they want to do. So, so even though this, of course, hampers our efforts to undo things, right, we're taking very seriously the idea that agencies should follow um, administrative procedures and give the public fair notice of, of the things that they plan to do. I hear in the aisle. First him and then you, sorry. Hi, Devin Watkins, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, I was wondering if they're not going to just look at the costs and benefits of the changes to the regulations, but also the costs and benefits of the entire regulatory scheme, like uh, CAFE standards. Often we look at the additional deaths that are caused by the change of CAFE standards and not the entire scheme and for cost and benefit analysis. Um. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I think that type of question varies from context to context, and it depends on the regulatory change that's being proposed. But I think in some cases where we're going to be produced, you know, where we're going to be looking at reforms, you know, we're going to have to take, kind of open up the costs and benefits of, of the larger regulatory scheme. Before going back there, just a quick amendment or, or a point on that because it ties back to what, what I think we were talking about before. There is the assessment of benefits and costs and trying to limit, in your case, trying to limit the, the costs. But as you said, first and foremost is deference to the statute and to the Constitution, but to the statutory authority. So it is entirely conceivable that you might have something like CAFSA standards that you think are consistent with the, the law is, but you find are, net, are costly or even negative net benefits. Mm -hmm. But there's no action on your part at that point. Is that correct? In other words... Everything has to be dictated by the law, whether or not you like the regulation or whether or not it's even a costly regulation. It's not presumed that it's going to always be a positive net benefit regulation. Well, I think that's right. I mean, sometimes statutes um, will require regulatory actions that may not be net beneficial yeah. based on some accounting of costs and benefits. And, and if that's what the statute requires, then... But your role still is to assess those benefits and costs, even if it's suggesting that, it, that they're costly on net. Yeah, I think that's part of part of the role, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I promised this gentleman right here next. At least so. then the public has awareness of what, you know, the cost of the right, of the statute might be then in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm Charlie Clark, a reporter with Government Executive. Mm -hmm. I was question about the expertise of career officials who've been balancing these decisions for decades. I'm just wondering that some critics feel that there's the current regulatory reform is driven by lobbyists who, who parachute in and pursuing their own interests. And the question is, do the career bureaucrats feel that they, uh, their expertise is being respected? Um, well, I, I can say for myself as the administrator, I very strongly respect the expertise of my career staff. And, um, and in my experience, I, I do not you know, our reform efforts aren't being driven by people who are parachuting in and um, asking us for de deregulatory reforms. I'll be honest. I mean, my career staff often come forward with lots of great ideas because they know the rules where, um, you know, that may not have really been net beneficial. They understand, you know, the, the limitations of previous regulatory impact analysis. And so they've been very helpful in, in coming forward with ideas for good government reform measures, and we've worked very closely with them. Can I just relate to that? In previous OIRAs actually occasionally did what was called prompt letters, I believe mm -hmm. it was. So coming from OIRA where they thought there was a, re a regulation that was uh, either necessary or was net beneficial, but that was not being done and essentially prompted the agency mm -hmm. uh, to regulate mm -hmm. instead of being reactionary and, uh, as its usual role. Has that happened under your term? Uh, no, I haven't issued any prompt letters. 
right over here, the woman over here, too, in, and just wait for the wait for the microphone, please. Hi, uh, I'm Kate Samini um, with Medill News. Um, sorry, going back to the woman from Bloomberg, I didn't understand your answer. How have you been evaluating uh, the cost being overstated and the benefits being understated? Well, I mean, I, I think that there are there are just there are some instances in which you know when you take a careful look at regulatory impact analysis, it seems like we could do better on you know a fair statement of the costs and benefits. I think this gets back to what I asked about the annual reporting of benefits and costs, where I think your answer was you're skeptical of those assessments. Well, in some cases, yeah. perhaps, yes. Mm -hmm. Let's go on this side of the room with the yellow tie. It pays to wear a yellow tie during the call line. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming here this morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Johnian. I'm a graduate student in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University. Okay. Uh, this semester, I'm taking a course in energy and security that I find fascinating. And I'm just wondering what you at OIRA and Administrator uh, Pruitt, uh, Secretary Zinke, and, and Secretary Perry are doing um, to sort of limit the compliance cost burden on natural gas and shale gas producers in the United States and what that means for the uh, energy revolution in America. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, I think all of those... Um, all of those agencies that you mentioned are looking closely at a number of these issues. I'm not sure you can say specifically what's happening right now. I mean, you can take a look at the unified agenda to sort of see what's coming up next, but I think that these are all things that they are considering seriously. Right here in the third row. Hi, um, I'm Alan Krupnik from Resources for the Future. We haven't talked too much about budgets uh, at the agencies. And I'm wondering if you think there's any incompatibility, and I, I worry about this, between these pretty large cuts we're looking at in agency budgets and their ability to do the analyses that go deeper than they've ever gone before to, to look more carefully at benefits and costs. And just to be clear, you're not talking about regulatory budgets. You're talking about no. I'm talking their, about agency budgets. Agency, that they, are, they don't have the wherewithal to do the staff, analysis. And then the complaint. Your your concern is that benefits and costs have somehow not been appropriately analyzed, but yet you're cutting back on the budgets at the agencies. I think um, you know. I mean, we haven't heard complaints that people lack the staff to do the analysis that's been required, and. Um, so, you know, I think that that, I mean, that's something to look at if people raise that issue, but, but I have not heard that complaint. Did you go already? All right. Sorry. <laughs> right there. Hi, I'm Paul Marion from MLEX, and I wanted to ask if your uh, discouragement of guidance and letters extends to Treasury and IRS in interpreting the uh, tax law. Would you rather see them come out with regulations, uh, no matter how long it takes, uh, than a notice or a letter or guidance? Mm -hmm. I think it's always hard to answer that, that question in the abstract, right? It, it depends on the particular issue. I mean, there's some, um, you know, we're not opposed to guidance that's truly guidance that's just simply explaining a statutory or regulatory requirement. So, um, you know, and oftentimes guidance can be helpful because it gives people you know, and businesses notice of what an agency believes that their laws or regulations mean. So there's certainly a role for guidance, and whether it's appropriate in a particular situation, I think just depends on the context. But who, who supposed, so this is an interesting issue, ties back to what we were talking about before. There's a gray area here, right? You're opposed to guidance that you think is masking what is actually regulation, but you, clearly there are some things that we shouldn't go through a regulatory process to clarify. Who determines what side of the line, who should determine what side of the line something like an IRS guidance falls or any guidance falls on that? Well, I mean, I do think the agency in the first instance is responsible for that. But, you know, under the executive order, significant guidance documents also come through a wire review. And so if there is a guidance document that imposes significant cost, right, it's economically significant or it's otherwise um, significant from a policy perspective, we should be taking a look at that. And, um, and then we might push back if it's an area we think is better addressed through regulation. But of course, it's the agencies, um, you know, in the first instance needs to make that call. I think we have time for a couple more. Uh, uh, let's go back. Right 
there. Yes. <laughs> uh, second in from the from the aisle. There you go. All right, thank you, Jonathan from Ta uh, Jonathan Curry from Tax Notes. This is to follow up on the last question about uh, the tax law. Um, have you coordinated with Treasury or IRS in any way as far as what you're looking for or what you want them to maybe shy away from in terms of issuing guidance? In terms of are we coordinating with them on that? Well, as I said, you know, the president issued an executive order that is requiring us to revisit the memorandum of understanding between OIRA and Treasury on the extent to which we review their, their rules, and, and that is an ongoing process. So we are, you know, in discussions with them about that. We have time for two more. Why don't you just go with the gentleman right there? <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Gary Becker. I'm chief economist at Catalyst. I used to also be a regulatory economist at about a half dozen agencies, including a detail at OIRA. So my question is this. I know from my years of experience that industry used to get nowhere with regards to a petition for rulemaking when it came to a deregulatory action. Mm -hmm. Could you address or discuss the fact that industry and associations can now develop petitions of rulemaking for deregulatory actions? And has OIRA developed new or modified guidelines for these petitions for rulemaking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we have, um, I think, I mean, as an administration, we have been seeking um, deregulatory ideas from the public in a variety of ways. You know, agencies have been encouraging public comments on this. You know, we certainly welcome petitions for deregulatory rulemakings. Um, you know, there have been a number of comments submitted with deregulatory ideas. So we, we are very, um, we'd like to engage with the public and with companies and with individuals on their regulatory reform ideas. So we, we absolutely encourage that and have done that in a, in a variety of ways. Right here in the light blue shirt towards the back on the aisle. Thank you, <clears throat> Todd Rubin. Uh, could you talk about uh, more about retrospective review um, and I, I, specifically apart from the two-for-one requirement, um, what OIRA can do to encourage agencies to not just look back at their rules a number of years after they've been passed, but to sort of think about retrospective review from the very outset, from the very planning of the rule. Mm -hmm. Could you just hold the answer and just take a couple more and we'll okay. close it with that. So uh, just move right up here in the checkered in the plaid shirt. Uh, yes, I'd like to hear uh, quite a bit more about the justification uh, for that March ruling uh, about saying that for the uh, Clean Power Act that this would, uh, you'd only be looking at uh, costs and benefits domestically and not at all internationally. I mean, if, you know, if you think that benefits have been overstated in the past, I'm a little curious what is the justification for only considering U.S. costs and benefits when in fact, when it comes to global warming, this is something that impacts the entire world very heavily. And I'm thinking especially in terms of rising sea levels, which would certainly affect you know, Bangladesh a whole lot more than right. anything, even Florida in the U.S. Okay, and I think we got we the question. we might have a benefit in terms of longer growing seasons, but what about drought throughout Africa and Latin America? Okay. Uh, one more over here. Just can you move it down three people, and we're going to close with that. So I think three is enough to remember. <laughs> Hi, uh, Chris Knight, a reporter with uh, Argus Media. Uh, President Trump mentioned cutting the number of pages in the C Code, of Federal, Code of Federal Regulations from 185,000 to 20,000, 1960 levels. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you guys decided 20,000 pages was a reasonable number? And also, are you going to be able to meet that target by in the next four years, eight years? Okay, so unfortunately, I know there's a lot more questions, but we're running out of time. You mm -hmm. have a question on retrospective analysis on the clean power plan using glo uh, domestic versus mm -hmm. global for social cost of carbon uh, and cutting the Code of Federal Regulations to 1960 levels mm -hmm. of 20,000 pages, not by changing the font. <laughs> this is pretty small already. Right, that's pretty small already. Yeah. Um, so, so I'll take you know, the retrospective review. Um, you know, I think, you know, how can we encourage that more? I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's so important about retrospective review is that when a rule is put into place, there is an anticipated cost and benefits, right? It's a projection of what the rule might cost, what its benefits might be. And so, of course, retrospective review is so important because it allows you to see what were the actual costs and benefits of a rule. And, and I know one thing that's been proposed, um, although I haven't really seen it done very often, is to build retrospective review into the rule itself, right? Just 
every rule has a provision that requires periodic review. You know, that's one possibility. But, but I do think, um, you know, everyone agrees retrospective review is good policy, but um, I do think the two for one gives some real teeth to it, right? Because if you have to find regulatory cost savings, you're going to need to look at rules and assess which ones aren't working and, um, and generate cost savings that way. So I think while retrospective review has been supported for a long time, I think we, we're giving some real, real teeth to that. Um, as to the Clean Power Plan, I mean, those are, those are all important concerns that were raised. I mean, I'm, I'm simply mentioning that the President's executive order talked about looking at domestic effects of, of CO2 emissions, and, and the administration is working through implementing how that is being done. Um, and then the final question was? Um, uh, 20,000 pages. 20,000 pages, right. Uh, so do the I take the over or under is the, the question. <laughs> yeah, so the President did mention that, I think, for um, to get down to those levels, you'd also have to have a lot of statutory reform because the growth from 1960 to today um, is largely based on a number of statutes that have required a lot of regulation. So you'd have to, you'd have to work with Congress in order to get back to those levels. Okay, with that, uh, unfortunately we're out of time. My apologies to those of you who had questions that we didn't have time to answer, uh, but please join me in thanking Administrator Rao for being here today. Thank you.